everyone who joined us today. Um, my name is Marika. I work at the Kabel office and I organize the distinguished lecture. And I'm very happy to welcome Vito Ruya today as our speaker. Thank you very much for being here and for giving this talk to us today. And thank you to you um, who are here and thank you to our Zoom audience as well. And um, I brought some Kabel nerds in case you want to take them in the end. Feel free to. And I also brought a Kaza and um, also attendance list. It doesn't ask a lot of info, just uh, we just ask you to write down your name so that you know who joins the lecture. And um, yeah, so that would be nice. And now I pass on the invisible mic to you. <laughs> and um, yeah, thank you again for being here. Yeah, thanks, thanks all for the lecture. So a few quick words about the speaker and about the event today. So first of all, let me clarify um, that uh, you know this is sort of like a joint distinguished lecture, uh, both from you know, Casa and from MDI. The individual is going to be meeting in the MDI, and you know the the, the the topic is very close to theory. So we sort of we might also talk about a little bit of the idea. Uh, so it would be similar to theory more open that we run by weekly. Um, and so, yeah, it's like a lot of things, and it, it's so nice because, like, people have to provide some fit everything. So, so I, I hope it will be an enjoyable talk for everyone. So, and just you know, for quick words about this book, he is currently a faculty at Carnegie uh, Mellon University, and a research scientist at and he is very well known for his work in uh, the internet and CN. Now, model cryptography, and uh, today it's about uh, communication assistance if you're about part communication. So, without further ado, okay, great. Uh, thanks and welcome, everybody. It's great to be here in uh, Bokum. Um, so, I'll talk about uh, secure multi party computation, in particular, the communication complexity of uh, secure multi party computation. And uh, most of these slides are kind of uh, stolen from my uh, PhD student, uh, Yifan. Uh, who has been working on MPC like uh, for his entire PhD. So let me start with some motivation for MPC. So let's say we have several hospitals. Uh, maybe they are doing some research on some particular type of chemotherapy for cancer patients. And let's say they want to understand what is the success rate of this particular treatment or something like that, right? So each of these hospitals have collected some data. And if they put their data together, then they can derive some important, maybe statistically significant inferences. But uh, just individually, the, the data of each hospital is not enough for this. Um, but the problem is that they cannot just you know, send the data to each other because uh, medical data is protected by various laws and so on, and you're not allowed to share the data without like explicit written consent of every patient. So. Secure multi-party computation would allow these hospitals to sort of run a protocol so that uh, they can compute a joint function on their whole data without revealing the individual data sets to each other. And secure multi-party computation is a very general tool in cryptography. Uh, it's useful in privacy preserving machine learning. Uh, uh, it's useful in uh, voting, uh, secure auctions, and so on. And uh, a little more precisely, in MPC, we have n players. Uh, they each hold private inputs. Let's call them x1 to xn. And we have a function uh, f, which would take all of these inputs and would give some output. So these players are interested in computing this joint function without leaking the individual inputs to each other. And this is an old problem, relatively old for cryptography. Uh, it was studied starting 1980s. And even in 1980s, these seminal works showed that MPC is actually possible for any function. So you have to represent the function as a circuit, a Boolean circuit, or an arithmetic circuit. And the number of gates in the circuit would determine how efficient your MPC protocol would be. But feasibility results were already obtained in 1980s. And you know, uh, for quite a while, this was just a purely theoretical topic within cryptography. But over the last like 10 to 15 years, people have been improving the efficiency of MPC protocols, and now more and more MPC protocols are also uh, sort of transitioning to practice. And by the way, feel free to stop me anytime. If you have any questions, you don't have to wait till the end. So uh, let me say a few words about our settings. So 
uh, in this talk, I'll primarily be concerned with arithmetic circuits. So what are arithmetic circuits? Uh, this is a circuit which is defined over a finite field. So each wire value is a value uh, coming from a field. And uh, the circuit might have either multiplication gates or addition gates. So again, multiplication or addition in a finite field. And of course, one can also consider Boolean circuits, but the advantage, uh, at least one advantage with arithmetic circuits is that uh, uh, <clears throat> you can like add or multiply large numbers in a single operation rather than having to break them into bits and so on. There are some disadvantages also like comparison is harder and so on, but, uh, but anyway, for things like matrix multiplication, uh, arithmetic circuit is a good model. Yeah. Uh, no, it can be ring. Yeah, there has been MPC on, on rings as well. And we assume that each pair of parties is connected using a point-to-point -point channel. Uh, so <clears throat> these point-to-point -point channels are authenticated, secure, and so on. And typically, we would denote by N the number of parties. And we'll denote by T the number of corrupted parties. So these are the parties which are malicious. They are trying to learn something about the inputs of the other parties and they might be colluding with each other. And uh, uh, there are also even two settings regarding what corrupted parties can do. So there's the so-called semi-honest security uh, where the adversaries are kind of curious. Uh, they want to find out the inputs of the other parties, but they follow the protocol instructions. Like you ask them to add two numbers, then they will follow that. Uh, <clears throat> And then there's the fully malicious security where adversaries can do anything arbitrary. Uh, Semi-honest security is typically, it's also called honest but curious. You're honest, but you want to learn something. Uh, this is typically a stepping stone towards achieving malicious security. And in most of this talk, I will just focus on semi-honest security, but most of our results can be extended to malicious security with some more work. And MPC has also been studied uh, with so-called computational security or unconditional security. In computational security, we need unproven cryptographic assumptions, like factoring is hard, we need to use public key encryption or so-called oblivious transfer. And these typically require more computation uh, and so on. Or we have unconditional security where uh, there are no unproven assumptions. So why do we ever consider computational? Seems like unconditional is like always better, but that's not the case because to get unconditional security, it is known that a majority of the parties must be honest. If you start with like N parties, we need to assume that half of them are honest, otherwise we cannot get unconditional security. So why unconditional security? So the nice thing is that it's free of expensive cryptographic operations. There's no encryption and so on. Uh, most of the operations are simple linear operations and the most efficient MPC protocols known are in the unconditional MPC paradigm. And in particular, we focus on communication complexity because uh, while talking about unconditional security, as I mentioned, local computations are just a series of linear operations, pretty fast. And generally the real world efficiency is dominated by the communication complexity rather than the local computation. So our goal would be to minimize the computational complexity, communication complexity, as much as we can. So here's the outline for rest of this talk. I will start with some background on secret sharing and what it is and how it can be used to build MPC. Then I'll talk about our results, uh, prior works. And then I'll talk about a key technique, which is called uh, the problem of sharing transformation. And then I will show how to use sharing transformation to build communication efficient MPC. Okay, so let's start with secret sharing, uh, so-called threshold secret sharing. So here we have a party who has some secret message M. So the secret sharing schemes would allow this party to break the message M into many parts. Let's call them shares, S1 to Sn, N shares. And the property is that if there's a party or an adversary which learns up to T shares, then it gets the adversary no information about the message M. But if any party can learn T plus one shares or, or more, then you can completely recover the messaging. 
And threshold secret sharing was introduced by Shamir in 1979. And uh, here is uh, a construction for uh, threshold secret sharing. Um, so you have to pick a random T degree polynomial over the finite field. Uh, and you are starting with some secret. So your polynomial should be such that the zeroth point of the secret uh, of the polynomial F0, that's the secret itself. And all other points are, are random. And now what are the shares? Let's say we have n parties, we need to generate n shares. The shares can just be F1, F2, and so on. So the polynomial evaluated on all these points. And now we can see that uh, if you get T plus one shares, you can reconstruct and recover this secret. How? You can do polynomial interpolation. If you have T plus one points on the polynomial and your degree is T, you can do polynomial interpolation. You can compute any point on the polynomial. And in particular, you can compute what F0 is. But it turns out that uh, if you have T or less shares, then you cannot do interpolation. And in fact, you can even prove that the secret is perfectly hidden in some sense. So as far as MPC is concerned, uh, there are two key properties which Shami uh, secret sharing has. Uh, which we will try to use. So here's some notation. Uh, when I write X in these brackets, T is the subscript. It denotes a degree T sharing of the value X. And if we have N parties, then each party will have a share of X. Okay, so there are two properties. So first is linear homomorphism. And it just says that uh, if you have a share of X and a share of Y, you add these shares locally, then you will get a share of the secret X plus Y. And why is that? Because if you add two polynomials, every point gets added. The resulting polynomial is basically a sum of the two polynomials on every point. So in particular, the zeroth point on the resulting polynomial will be a sum of the zeroth points on the two polynomials which you started with, and hence, the secret of the resulting polynomial would be X plus Y. And uh, if you just add like your local shares, you are adding two points on the starting polynomials, you get a point on the resulting polynomial. This is a very nice property. And then there's also something interesting which we can say about multiplication. So if you multiply your shares, then you do get a share of the polynomial which has x times y as the secret, but now the resulting polynomial has a higher degree. If you multiply two polynomials with degree t, the resulting polynomial has degree 2t. So you end up getting a secret sharing of x times y, but with a slightly higher degree. So these two properties, in some sense, allow us to evaluate uh, addition gates and multiplication gates. Yeah, except for the zeroth point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So generally, what you have to do is you also have to pick another random degree two t polynomial whose zeroth point is zero, and then you add it to that. Yeah. Yeah. Good observation. All right, so again, let's keep in mind that all our parties are semi-honest. They are just curious, but they follow the instructions. So n parties, and we set the threshold t, which is the number of corrupted parties, to be just slightly less than n by two. And this, this means that any t parties can learn no information about any of the shares. Now, to start with, every party has an input, and every party secret shares its input using a degree T secret share, degree T polynomial. So I have my input Xi, I secret share Xi, and I distribute the shares to the other parties. So the parties now, at the beginning of the protocol, they start with secret sharing of X1, X2, and so on. And now you are given this circuit. Uh, this is the function which you want to evaluate for MPC. And the high level idea is, you start uh, with a sharing of the wire values for the input wires, 
and you want to inductively get uh, sharing of the values on every wire in the circuit. So for each wire, you have to compute a secret sharing of the values carried by this wire. And you start with the input gates. So, so the problem is reduced to evaluating multiplication gates and evaluating addition gates. Yeah. Sorry, say that again. Yeah, actually, that's not the case. Yeah. Uh, so you can think of it as follows. So if I have T points on the polynomial, one point is completely free, which means that like you have every possibility for the zeroth point. You know, every possibility of the zeroth point would define a polynomial and you have no idea which one is correct. Okay, so let's look at addition gate. Addition gate is relatively simple. So, so these are the input wires, X and Y, and you have secret sharing of them. Each party without talking to any other party just locally adds its shares to get shares of Z, which is equal to X plus Y. And this can be done by just adding the shares. And this follows from linear homomorphism. So addition gates, this sort of come for free, no communication. What is that uh, X is that one value or a set of values? So this is just a secret sharing of X. X is a single value. X is the value on that particular input wire. And this denotes that the parties hold a secret sharing of X. So this is a set of uh, Yeah. I mean, X itself is just a single value. Yeah. But when you look at the bracket, it's really N values. Exactly. Uh, because there are n shares of x. Yeah, this is a finite field addition. Uh, yeah, not yet. Yeah. Yeah. So this is one polynomial, this is another. Yeah. And let's say I am the ith party, I have ith point on polynomial for x, polynomial for y, I just add them. And then I'll get the ith point for polynomial of c. So addition gets slightly more tricky. tricky. So again, our input is this sharing of x and y, and, and our goal is to compute a sharing of x times y. So as I mentioned before, the main observation is that you can just multiply again your shares locally and you get a share of the correct value with, but with higher degree. So we obtain a 2T degree sharing of the output, but since T was less than half, 2T is still less than N, which means that if all N parties come together, they can still reconstruct the secret. So this, is, this shows that why T less than half was important, why honest majority is important for these type of techniques to work. And uh, of course, we cannot just leave it as it is because if there are further multiplication gates, then the degree will keep increasing. So there's also a degree reduction step, which I don't want to go into, right? Okay, so this is like the basic high level overview. Most MPC protocols work like this. And uh, <clears throat> So suppose this C is the circuit and uh, uh, size of the circuit uh, is this and N is the number of parties. So people have been studying this for like 30 years and the best known communication complexity here is O of N times the circuit size. So the overall protocol communicates these many field elements. So essentially, if you look at the field element, it's constant field elements per gate per party. C is the number of gates. Yeah. It's the case with both. Yeah. And uh, this was a result from 2007, which, which gave this. And the last 15 years, people have just been trying to improve the constants for this. So uh, the best known constant uh, is our paper from last year, which is four and a half field elements. 
per gate. So, you know, it's not probably not much scope unless there's a breakthrough here. So I would like to get rid of this factor N. That would be my goal for this talk. And uh, the idea is that if the number of parties is very large, which is kind of people are talking about it, like blockchains, there are large number of parties, large number of miners, they want to run an MPC and so on. So there are various settings where N is very large. And in that case, uh, if your communication grows linearly with N and the size of the circuit, maybe you, know, you want to do better than that. So now let me uh, go to our problem and uh, our results and the prior works. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also the initial communication when I share my input. Okay. So in our work, we consider what is known as the suboptimal honest majority. So, so far I, I thought of T as something like N by two. But now I would think of T as something like one minus epsilon times N by two. So instead of 50% parties being corrupted, think of it as like 46% corrupted or something like that. So I'm aiming for like a weaker result. Uh, but my goal overall would be to have O of one by N field elements per gate per party rather than O of one. So the total communication I would like is O of C. So this would be a factor of an improvement. And we are not the first ones to, to try to do this. There have been quite a few previous works, but getting O of C communication was open. I'll talk about the previous works in a little bit. So why, why should we go to suboptimal corruption threshold? Why not stick to optimal? Well, so I would like to say that 49% or 50% is pretty arbitrary anyway. So for example, MPC on blockchains, people have studied this. The security of blockchain any, anywhere relies on the so-called honest majority assumption where something like half of the miners are honest. So is there such a big difference between, uh, let's say 49% corruption versus tolerating 45% corruptions? It's not clear, right? Maybe there are some settings where 45 is fine. Or you can think about secure voting. So think about running an MPC for voting. If uh, close to 45 or 50% of the parties are anyway corrupted, then they can anyway probably dictate the result of, of voting, right? So it's reasonable to assume that uh, uh, something like 45% is honest. And there are many other settings where we have a large number of parties, it's reasonable to assume that more than half are honest. So as I said, uh, <clears throat> previous works have considered this, uh, this suboptimal threshold setting. Uh, starting from the work of uh, Franklin and Young from 92. And what they did was uh, they considered running O of N copies of the same circuit. So it's like the uh, single instruction, multiple data setting. So you have some data sets, uh, you have multiple data sets, but you want to evaluate the same circuit. And the amortized communication complexity they showed can be as low as O of C, but we are interested in the single circuit setting. And in the single circuit setting, there have been these works which had these lock factors, pretty recent work, which uh, looked at a restricted class of circuits and they were able to get O of C. But basically, you know, uh, the, for the last 30 years, in general for a single circuit, we haven't been able to get uh, O of C. Yeah. Uh, then it's hard to get uh, anywhere. Uh, there are no known impossible results that I know. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is what we achieve. Uh, so we have an arithmetic circuit C. You can take any constant epsilon. And if T is half minus epsilon times N, then there's an information theoretic MPC which computes the circuit C with O of C communication. So example, T is like 0.49N, then your communication is uh, O of C. So the nice thing here is that as the number of parties go up, then the work or the communication per party goes down. So this is a factor of an improvement compared with protocols in the honest majority setting where we have half honest parties. Yeah. <laughs> Or 
Yeah, this is swallowed by the O. Uh, so here it would be something like O of N by epsilon, the constant here. So if epsilon is O of N, then it is a constant. But for example, let's say your epsilon is 0 0.01, then N by epsilon becomes like 100. So greater your epsilon is, the smaller this constant becomes. Yeah, it's it's really just n by epsilon. There might be a two factor there, and and that's it. Yeah, I mean the the lower you set it, the better your constant here. Becomes. You know, if you have one about 10,000 of mine, or if you say, you know, you need 20 percent that you could do it, that might already be a huge number, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah 20 percent might be reasonable in long okay. yeah. So there are also some implications to the dishonest majority setting, mm -hmm. if that's what we are most interested in. So, as I mentioned, information theoretic MPC cannot exist without dishonest majority. So to overcome this impossibility result, people have proposed what is known as a circuit independent pre-processing phase, where uh, there's some, you can think of it as like correlated randomness, R1 to Rn, maybe some trusted party generates it, or maybe there's another MPC which generates it, but this can be done before the data, before the circuit is known. And the parties sort of store this information. And uh, after that, you can have unconditional MPC even with dishonest majority. Uh, so here our T can be as high as one minus epsilon times N uh, for a constant N. And in the online stage, we get the same result. So o of one by N field elements per gate per party. But in the pre-processing stage, uh, we will get O of one field elements. And there was no prior work in the dishonest majority setting which had uh, uh, anything close to these parameters. Okay, but anyway, most of my talk will be on the honest majority setting. So this is sort of the main theorem for dishonest majority. Uh, it's just O of C elements and the threshold is one minus epsilon times N. So there have been previous works which try to use pre-processing and try to reduce uh, the communication in the online phase after the pre-processing phase, uh, a couple of these works. So the problem with both of these works is that they end up requiring um, exponential sized pre-processing phase, but they can achieve linear communication complexity similar to ours. So anyway, this was kind of a detour. Now, now let's get back to the honest majority setting and let me try to walk you through the main technique which is also common uh, to the previous works. And it's called packed secret sharing. So what is packed secret sharing? So remember last time we were just storing the secret here at a single point, which was F0. Uh, the polynomial has a number of possibilities. You can even store more secrets on the polynomial. So maybe like you store a secret at F0, this is F minus one, minus two and so on. So you can store any number of secrets you want on a single polynomial. And the nice thing is, uh, when you add two polynomials, all of their points get added. So in fact, if you add two polynomials, all the secrets will get added. And similar for multiplication, this is what we will try to uh, exploit. Yeah. So it's limited by the, by the size of the field. And also the, you're talking about the corruption threshold. Yeah, but you can increase the degree. Yeah, but yeah, there, there's a limitation. So first of all, let me talk about the notation. So I will still call all of these secrets. I will denote them as X, but now X becomes a vector rather than a single quantity scale. Another thing as, as probably Julio already observes that the degree of the polynomial here needs to be higher and we can never take the degree more than N. So N is really the upper limit. 
because if you keep the degree more than n, then even if all the parties come together, they cannot reconstruct. Right, right, right. So degree is sort of the sum of all of these. Yeah. Right. So if I uh, let me go to the next slide, I think. Yeah. So <clears throat> first, go. Let's go through linear homomorphism, and then I'll talk about the multiplication. <clears throat> So if you add two polynomials, then as I said, every single point gets added. The resulting polynomial is the sum of the two polynomials on every point. So all the secrets get added in a single operation. So you still have linear homomorphism with packed Shamir secret shares. And now multiplication, <clears throat> right? So if you multiply two polynomials, you get a resulting polynomial. And again, every point on the resulting polynomial is a multiplication of the underlying polynomial. So all your secrets uh, get multiplied. The degree goes up by a factor of two and you have to run degree reduction, but uh, we can do that. So does that answer your question? Uh -huh. uh, okay, so let's call the polynomials F1 and F2. Uh, F1 has the vector x, f2 has y, and uh, the resulting polynomial is g, right? So let's define g of x to be f1 of x times f2 of x. And now uh, you can take the zeroth point, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was. Yeah, you are doing point-wise multiplication of the polynomial. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in fact, we can only do point-wise multiplication of the polynomials because the individual parties only have points on two polynomials, so they can multiply these points. They don't have the whole polynomial to multiply. It, it, it does, because the new polynomial G of X is still F1 times F1 of X times F2 of X. So the, yeah, if you do pointwise multiplication, then that's what you will end up getting. You will end up getting points on G. Yeah, maybe I can even write here. I'll have to go from the camera a little bit, but uh, so your polynomial is F1 of X. And let's say this is the polynomial I want to define, right? This is, uh, so this is just, I'm just defining G of X now, okay. right? And now how do I compute points on G of X? If let's say I had F1 of I and I had F2 of I, I want to compute G of I. How do I do that? Just do a finite field multiplication and you will get a point on G of I. So just pointwise multiplication, yeah, this is an interesting thing. Just pointwise multiplication gives you point on G of I. But G of I has now a higher degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now this gives us hope for doing something much better with MPC. <clears throat> um, so we had these y values x1 to xk, let's say, and here I'm introducing k as the packing parameter. So we will have k secrets in a single polynomial and k would be derived from t and n. We can think of k as something like uh, n by three or something like that. Now, instead of having a separate secret sharing of these k values, I put them all in a single sharing, in a packed sharing. And now my hope is that I have a packed sharing of x1 to xk and another packed sharing of y1 to yk. I can do addition as well as multiplication with a single operation. And ideally the cost per gate is reduced by a factor of k. That's sort of the high level idea, but there are many things that we have to deal with. So now my circuit looks like this. 
I take many multiplication gates, which are within sort of the same layer, same level in the circuit. I batch them together. So this is a batched multiplication gate. It takes K inputs here, K inputs here, multiplies all of them. And similarly, the addition gate. So a high level idea is you group gates of the same type. So now each party will share its inputs using a packed secret sharing scheme. So we have one sharing of this, one sharing of all these wires and so on. And before you evaluate the multiplication gate, you want to create a single packed secret sharing of these wires. And similarly here, and then hopefully with cost one, I can compute a packed sharing of these wires and I can keep going. So now the main difficulty here is what is known as in the literature network routing. Uh, <clears throat> so the question is, how do we prepare packed sharings of the current layer from the output sharings of the previous layer? So let's try to understand it with an example. So look at these uh, three wires. So here, this secret is coming from this packed sharing. This secret is coming from this packed sharing and so on. And the idea is that uh, between every two layers, the, the wires could be permuted in an arbitrary way, could be connected in an arbitrary way, uh, or could be routed in an arbitrary way. So we can isolate two difficulties. So first difficulty is ordering the secrets, secret, secret ordering. So here, when you got the output, you got x1, x2, and x3. But when you want to feed it as input, you want to feed x2, x3, and x1. You want to align this and this properly so that the corresponding secrets get added properly. And difficulty two is what is known as a secret collection, where uh, you know there are three different secrets we are interested in, but they are coming from different pack sharings. And you want to put them in a single pack share so that you can later on evaluate multiplication gates to that. <clears throat> so we will try to solve these two problems efficiently. And for that, we will use what is known as a sharing transformation. So let me just try to define what sharing transformation is, and then we will see how to use it. <clears throat> so in sharing transformation, uh, we have two linear secret sharing schemes. Uh, let's call them sigma and sigma prime. Uh, <clears throat> They could be both Shamir, but with different degrees, or they could be completely different secret sharing schemes. And you also have a linear function, and they are all in the same finite field. So function is F. So the idea is that parties hold a sigma sharing of the value X, and their goal is to obtain a sigma prime sharing of uh, F of X. And you want to do it as efficiently as, as, as possible. And here, X can also be a vector uh, if we are using a packed secret sharing. So F of X is also a vector. So they have many components and each component of F of X is a linear combination of the components of X. And why do we bother with this problem? Let me give you two examples where it will be useful. One we have already seen, which is degree reduction. That's, that's why I was sort of, putting degree reduction uh, to a later point. So you can locally compute, but it results in a different uh, secret sharing. I mean, it's still Shami, but with a higher degree. And you need to transform the result to the original secret sharing scheme. And you can do this using a sharing transformation. Take a degree 2T sharing, you can convert it into a degree T sharing. This is a linear function. And the second is just network routing which is what we are interested in. So we need to perform a linear map on the secrets of a single sharing. So <clears throat> sometimes we need to permute the wires. We have already seen an example of that. Uh, there's also fan out gates, which might be present in the circuit. So you have a packed secret sharing of X1, X2, and X3, but maybe what you want is a packed sharing of X1, X1, and X3. So this can also be seen as an instance of sharing transformation. So the question is, can we do sharing transformation efficiently? And uh, this is what we do essentially. <clears throat> um, so we have many instances of these sharing transformations. Let's say K instances. 
uh, <clears throat> let's call them sigma i, sigma i prime, and fi, where i is from one to k. And you can transform all the xi's to sharings of fi of xi. Uh, you can do the whole batch together, and the chief communication complexity is O of n. And I will try to use this tool in a black box here to build MPC. So we have a generic approach for sharing transformation, works for any linear secret sharing scheme. Um, and this essentially enables a new approach for MPC. Okay, so the last part of my talk will be how we solve these two problems, the, the problem of network routing using sharing transformation. So let's come to the first difficulty, which is secret reordering. You got the output in some order, you want to change the order. And this is just a direct application of sharing transformation. Second difficulty, secret collection. So here, the secrets that you are interested in is spread across three different packed sharings. And we want to collect them into a single pack share. So here it's unclear how we can directly use sharing transformation because sharing transformation operates on a single vector. And we have here we have to somehow combine three different vectors. <clears throat> so let's change the example a little bit. Let's say we are interested in this x1, y2, and z3. They are all in different positions. And our goal is to obtain a sharing of, of this value. Now, if I had a way of multiplying this vector by a unit vector, let's say one zero zero, then I would get a packed sharing whose secrets are x one zero comma zero. Here I multiply by a different unit vector and so on. So let's say I have a packed sharing of x one comma zero comma zero. 0, y2, 0, and so on. Now what can I do? I can just add all of these three together, and I will end up getting a sharing of the value which I wanted. So the only important thing is that these secrets should be in different positions so that they don't get added to each other. Now, how can we achieve this multiplying by a unit vector? This is actually not very hard. So remember that x1, x2, and x3, they are points on a polynomial. And you want to multiply these points with 1, 0, 0. So just pick another random polynomial where the corresponding points are 1, 0, and 0. And now again, you do a pointwise multiplication of these polynomials. And the resulting polynomial would have the corresponding points as x1, 0, comma 0. And the degree goes up, but degree can be reduced. Okay, so this is good. Are we done already? Now we can collect the secrets from different sharings. Well, the problem is what if you have points which you're interested in, they are all in the first position, let's say. So then if you add these three, you would end up getting a sharing of X1 plus Y1 plus Z1, rather than this, what we want. So we are calling this a collision and we need to ensure no collision property. The goal is for each sharing, uh, the secrets we need to collect, they must all come from different positions in the previous sharing. And to, to be able to do that, we introduce what we call sparsely packed Shamir secret sharing. So let's go back to packed Shamir secret sharing. Here, uh, you know, it's a, it's a large finite field, let's say. And we have a few designated positions where we are storing the secrets. We can also represent it as, as this. Uh, so this is a polynomial F. These are the points on this polynomial. And uh, <clears throat> so alpha one up to alpha N, these are uh, the points on which you need to evaluate the polynomial to get the shares of N parties. And let's say the secrets are stored at point one, two, and three. So we will denote it as packed secret sharing, S1, S2, and S3, where the shares can be found at one, two, and three, where the secrets can be found at one, two, and three. 
But why are we using one, two, and three? We could have used any point. There's nothing special about one, two, and three. We could store the secrets differently. I could just for fun store secrets at one, three, and five. The finite field is large. It's a lot of possibility. So the idea behind sparsely packed semi-sharing is that different sharings, they store secrets in different locations altogether for the whole circuit. Every wire has a packed secret sharing. Every wire will store secrets in a different location. And to do this, we just need the field size to be something like greater than size of the circuit plus 10. So now let's say we have these three group of wires. Here I'm storing secrets on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so on. So now we don't have collisions anymore. We can come back to network routing and non-collision properties sort of achieved for free. Yeah. It's right, good. Yeah, I'll talk about that. So now, <clears throat> Yeah, we have these three groups and suppose we want to collect secrets X1, Y1, and Z1, and we want to store them at some position 10, 11, and 12. So step one for us is locally compute X1, Y1, Z1. So remember that X1 was at position one, Y1 was at position four, Z1 was at position seven. So we want to locally compute this. And how do we do that? So first, uh, let's just maybe change our point of view. All three sharings can be viewed as sharings that use position one, four, and seven. It's because we only care about the secrets at one, four, and seven. Now, I don't know what, uh, what the value here at four and seven is and similarly and so on, but that's fine. Some value polynomial is well-defined everywhere. And now recall the technique by where we multiplied by a unit vector. So we multiply by a unit vector here, here, and so on, so that these other points, they are made to be zero. And then you add all of them together, and then you have x1, y1, and z1. But they are stored at one, four, and seven, and we wanted them stored at, let's say, 10, 11, and 12. How do we do that? This is just sharing transformation. As soon as you get all your secrets in a single pack sharing, you can do a lot of things. So you can move these points to 10, 11, and 12. This is just a linear map. So each sharing transformation is different and we will end up using a sharing transformation for every gate. And now an omitted case, the last, which I did not talk about, circuit can also have fan out gates apart from addition and multiplication. So we need to prepare uh, a sharing with repeated secrets. So you take this X1, I don't care what value we have here and Y1. And using a sharing transformation, you can make copies of X1 and put it in the desired location. So now just to summarize, how do we do addition gates? So we will evaluate addition in a batch of K gates uh, from the same circuit layer. So prepare one patch sharing for the first set of input wires that's denoted by X, another for the second set of uh, input wires Y. Uh, suppose the output wire storing positions must be 10, 11, and 12. So you need to collect the shares here as well as shares here and put them in position 10, 11, and 12. This can be done by using sharing transformation. And then finally, addition can be done locally. And the secrets in Z would already be in the right position. And similar for multiplication gate, you can evaluate them in batches of K gates. So you have X and Y, two different pack sharings. And you can, for multiplication, it's kind of easier to put the secrets in a default position, one, two, and three. You can multiply locally. We need to introduce sort of a new technique here. It's called packed beaver triple. I will not go into that. Uh, <clears throat> and after the multiplication is done, you can move the secrets to the position that you want. 
So the summary here is that uh, packed secret sharing allows us to reduce the cost of MPC by a factor of N. If your number of parties is large, this can be pretty substantial. And yep, that's it. <laughs>